Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you for bringing us here once again to look at the face of Jesus Christ. What a glorious experience it was for John the Beloved when he saw Christ. Christ exalted. Christ glorified. Christ the reigning king. Christ the head of the church. Christ the prince of peace. Christ the master of angels. Christ the unique beloved son of the heavenly father. Lord, today, as we come to this study of the word, we pray that you reveal Christ to every one of us in Jesus' name. And nobody ever saw you in reality, O oh Lord, and remained the same. Therefore, Lord, we're praying that as you reveal Christ to us this very day, we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. The beauty, the glory, the splendor, the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, his dominion, his power, his knowledge, love, that cannot be surpassed. Lord, reveal to us this very time in Jesus' name. That Lord, as John, the beloved, on the Isle of Patmos, saw you, and it had effect, unforgettable effect on him, as we come today to see you, Lord, May this vision of Christ have unforgettable impact and influence upon every life of everyone hearing this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. Reveal yourself. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said a good amen. You know, I always like to have an excited congregation. When I read the Bible, study the Bible, preach the Bible, I get turned on. I'm excited. And as the speaker is excited, the hearers too ought to be excited. It was still in Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, I've been going through a series. And the first message was... The revelation of Christ's future glory. The second one, Christ's grace, glory, and dominion. And the third one, which we had yesterday, the certainty of Christ's second coming. And now the message of this morning, the vision of a glorified Christ. If you are listening to this message, maybe some weeks or months after this, or even some years after this, and this is the only cassette you are hearing, I want to encourage you that all these messages are tied together. And if you want to get the real impact and the full thing that we've done here talking about this glorified Christ, building a glorious church, you need to get the whole series and for those of you who are here and you've been listening, you know, you listen and after a week or a month, you might forget all the details. Uh, the best thing for you to do will be to get all the four messages on this series and then just listen over and over and over and it will do your life good. Will you do that? I said, will you do that? Please. Uh, by the case it will do you good. We're in Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, I'm now in verse 9, all through to verse 20. The vision of the glorified Christ. And John, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. And in the patience of Jesus Christ, 
which was in the isle island of island that is called Patmos for the word of God for the testimony of Jesus Christ I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. I knew him before. I saw him before. I recognized him. But now different. Clothed in a garment down to his foot. And girt about with paths. About the paths. With a golden girdle. He said, and his ears were white as wool. And white as snow. As white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand, his right hand, upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Right. The things which thou seest, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels, the leaders, the ministers of the seven churches. And the seven gold and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And that's what we're looking at today. Before the revelation of the events. That you have recorded in the whole book of Revelation. Before the revelation of those events. That will, have, that will accompany the glorious return of Christ. John was granted the vision of the glorified Christ. And John, you know, he had seen Jesus in the days of his flesh. And now he was allowed to see him in his glorified form. The vision of Jesus which John saw was not a vision of how Jesus will be in the future when he comes to establish the millennial reign. It was a vision of how Jesus is at the present time. And John introduces himself. He almost could not believe because here he was. He was suffering persecution. And the believers of that time, they suffered persecution because the mission who was reigning at that time counted Christians as criminals, as if they were enemies of the nation, as if they were enemies of the empire because their ways were different from the ways of the world. And they will not bow to any other king, they say, Jesus is Lord. 
They saw those Christians as rebels. They saw those believers as people that are uncompromising and they will not cooperate with the laws of the land. Actually, those Christians were law abiding. But the only thing is that whenever the laws of men conflicted with the laws of God, they were on the Lord's side. And the stage on that Lord's side, obeying, accepting, submitting to the Lordship of Christ, and they were loyal to the watch of the Lord. So, those unbelieving leaders that did not understand the principle behind their action, they didn't understand the understanding, the knowledge, the light. And the pivot of their very lives, they need to understand, they counted them as criminals and as rebels. And so they were persecuting them. But then all the other apostles had died. Paul had died. Peter had died. James had died. Andrew had died. Matthew had died. All the other apostles had died except this John. And he knew the Lord as a young man. And by this time now, he was about age between 80 and 90. And this man, as old as he was, he refused to retire. And he was still encouraging the believers to stand in the persecution, telling them the words of Jesus Christ, Blessed are you when men shall revile you, and when men shall say all manner of evil against you, and they shall persecute you for the sake of Jesus Christ. Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Rejoice therefore and be glad when you are persecuted. This John, as a leader, the last surviving apostle. He was encouraging them. And then Domitian and his people, they knew that uh, this fellow, although he is old, instead of retiring and getting ready to just pass up, he was still encouraging these people in their understanding. Understand now? In their understanding, he was encouraging them to rebel against the land, against the government of the day. He wasn't telling them to rebel. He was just telling them that Jesus is Lord. He was just telling them that God had given Jesus a name above every name that had a mention of the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's all he was doing. But then they counted him as the greatest of the criminals as a chief of the criminals and he said we're persecuting all these members of the church and uh, uh, there's something there's something behind this there's somebody that uh, you know is encouraging them so they picked up on john and they had uh, they had done a lot of things to him and the man you know just kept on going so they said all right we'll banish him to the isle of patmos to an island all alone by himself and we're told that those days when they did something like that it, it, there were two kinds of people they banished like that number one the political uh, kind of um, guilty people it was just political others criminals but they didn't classify john as a person that was wrong and did something wrong on the political in the political sense they counted him as the worst of criminals and they had punished him they punished him this way he didn't change they punished him this way he didn't change and they put him in a pot of boiling oil and the man did not die and the man was not hurt and the man did not change <laughs> they said this kind of man how would you do with this man tell me what can the devil do with a man what can Domitian do with a man what can Nero do with a man that says Jesus is my Lord and do whatever 
and add, however, Jesus is my Lord. What are we going to do with this man? That's why they banished him. And, and it's not just ordinary banishment to hard labor. And John submitted to that, and he was there in the Isle of Patmos. But you know, he didn't know that at the time of the greatest suffering, the way of God is, he gives you the greatest revelation. That's why he started in verse 9, and he said, I, John, you understand? You understand? He said, can you imagine this? I, John, can you imagine this? The people in the palace didn't have a revelation like this. I, in this island of the Patmos, I, John, can you imagine this? When I was free, and when there was no persecution like this, and when everything was going well, everything going all right, and when I had all the other disciples, all the other younger believers around me, and they were taking care of me as old man, old minister, experienced minister, they were all surrounding me. I didn't have a revelation like this, and now they banish me to the Isle of the Patmos. Can you imagine this? I, John, I saw, he saw the glory of the Lord. I pray you will see the glory of the Lord. And then he began, he wrote down, because the Lord told him to write. In the case of Paul the Apostle, when he went to the third heavens, the Lord told him not to talk about it, not to write what he had seen. In the case of John, all that he saw, of the glory of God. All that you saw of the majesty and dominion of the coming King Christ. All that you saw of the plenitude and the fullness of the Spirit of God. All that you saw about the worship of God in heaven. All that you saw about the adoration of the living of the living creatures, the four bees before the throne of God. All that you saw about how the 24 elders were laying down their crowns. All that you saw about the redeemed soul of the Lord crying glory and honor and dominion unto the Lord in heaven. All that you saw about the lamb that was slain and about the lamb that reigns on the throne. All that he saw about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. All that he saw about the river of life. About the tree of life. All that he saw about when Christ will come and he will take up the glory and the dominion and reign all over the earth. Paul was not allowed to write his own. But in the case of John, John was commanded all that you see, all that you have seen, all that are taking place now in all the churches of Asia Minor, and all the things that will be that will shortly come to pass, write everything down. And that's the privilege we have now, and we're looking at John, and we're looking at what he has written, because the Lord commanded him to write. And there are three, there are three divisions to the message of this morning. Number one, the persecution of Christians before the vision. The persecution of Christians before the vision. Number two, the portrait of Christ in the vision. The portrait, the picture, the appearance of Christ in the vision. And then, number three, the purpose of commission after the vision the purpose of commission after the vision come back to number one the persecution of christians before the vision in john in um, revelation chapter one revelation chapter one i'm reading from verse nine i john who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle in the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit 
on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, and unto Tyra, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. The persecution of Christians before the vision. John mentioned three things about himself and about his fellow Christians. Number one, he said, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. He said, I am your companion in tribulation. I know you are going through it. I am going through it. We're in the same thing. We're in the same boat. We're serving the same Christ. And we're experiencing the same consequence. Your brother, your companion in tribulation. Number two. He said, I am your companion in the kingdom. In the kingdom. After he said, yes, in the tribulation. But the tribulation has not taken us away from the kingdom. If the tribulation has done anything, it's that it has deepened our roots in the kingdom. If the persecution, if the suffering has done anything, it has driven us inside, nearer, the very center of the kingdom. If the persecution, if the suffering has done anything at all, it has given us a greater appreciation of the kingdom. If the persecution has done anything at all, it has given us a greater hold on the inheritance of the kingdom. Number one, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. Number two, I am your brother and companion in the kingdom. Number three, I am your brother and companion in the patience, perseverance of Christ. In the patience and the, and the perseverance of Christ. If the persecution has done anything at all, it has given us patience, the patience of Christ, the perseverance of Christ. If the persecution, if the suffering has done anything at all, companions in persecution, companions in tribulation, brothers in persecution, brothers in tribulation, if the tribulation, if the persecution has done anything for us at all, it has erased it has taken away it has obliterated it has totally erased the impatience we used to have you know when i was a child i thought as a child i spoke as a child i understood as a child and when we were young christians babes in christ how impatient we were Give me this, give me this, give me this now. Remove this pain, remove this problem now. Don't allow me to suffer. Remove it now, remove it now. When we were children. But as the persecution has continued, as the suffering has continued, if the suffering John said has done anything, it has made us companions, brothers, fellows, friends. Members of the family of God has given us patience. The patience of Jesus Christ. Patience. The patience of Jesus. You understand what John is saying? The patience of Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. How Jesus was born in a manger. And he knew he was going to reign as a king. And he was patient. He was waiting patiently. How Jesus Christ did not even go to the temple to show himself as anybody until the age of 12. And he was waiting patiently. And then after the 12 years, he became 30 years of age before he ever appeared in Jordan. Before John the Baptist to be baptized in water. And for people to hear from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
patience and then for Jesus Christ to carry the cross and go and die for the salvation of the world and yet Pilate was asking are you a king then so do you say for this purpose was I born he was to be a king where is the king of the Jews and yet he was not reigning as king yet patience and John said if this persecution tribulation has done anything for us at all it has taught us the patience of Jesus Christ and then he said don't you know I'm now at the Isle of Patmos I was in the Isle of Patmos and the very the very fact that he said he was in the Isle of Patmos means he didn't die there he came back and by the time he was now writing to them, sending this to them, he had, they are taking him from that place because they saw that the persecution, the tribulation was actually even getting him deeper into his roots in Christ. And then he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. He said, Inside that persecution, when the Lord's day came, I knew the Lord's day, Sunday, the first day of the week. I was in the spirit. Yes, persecution is there, but I was still in the spirit. You see, persecution does not take away spiritual growth. It does not take away, it does not hinder your being in the spirit, serving the Lord, how encouraging it is to learn that persecution or physical suffering does not hinder God's revelation to fulfill to faithful children, the faithful children of God. The persecution and earthly trouble does, do not necessarily hinder spiritual fellowship and spiritual growth. Don't you remember Moses? He wrote the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy in the wilderness while he was enduring the heavy burden of leading the children of Israel. Oh yes, the problems were there. There were even times they wanted to stone him. That didn't hinder him. From getting the revelation that he now recorded Genesis to Deuteronomy. How about David? He was still inspired to write many psalms while he was being persecuted and chased around by Saul. How about Isaiah? He still received the prophecies concerning Christ amid trouble and persecution. Do you remember Ezekiel? How the Lord showed him the visions you have in the book of Ezekiel while he was in exile. How about Jeremiah? He wrote that book when he was under serious trial and deprivation that became almost unbearable. Yet, the revelation of the Lord and the prophecies were still given to him. How about Peter? Peter wrote those epistles just before he died and he was crucified. How about Paul? Paul received the revelations and the mysteries of the kingdom that he is that is written in the epistles of Paul while he was suffering persecution and loneliness in his imprisonment. The point the Lord is telling us is persecution does not end the revelation. Persecution does not hinder seeing the vision of the glorified Christ. Uh, you know, some people say, you know, uh, the, the church in our region is suffering persecution. The church in my locality is suffering persecution. And the persecution is so much that, you know, we cannot be in the spirit anymore. We cannot be spiritual anymore. Pray for us. Because if this persecution continues, we will never be able to have spiritual growth. No, no, no. In the midst of that persecution, in the midst of the banishment, in the midst of the loneliness, in the midst of all the suffering that the people of the world can heap upon you, you can be in the spirit on the Lord's day. John's banishment in the now in the Isle of Patmos 
was because of his loyalty to the word of God on the one hand, his faithfulness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. He took the totality of the word of God. And he had been the one that laid his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ. And he knew Jesus. And there was no place Jesus went that, G that John was not there. When Jesus was to go to any special place, there were three disciples in the inner circle. Peter, James, John. And Peter had died. And James had died. And the only one remaining in the inner circle was this John. And he said, I saw a lot. When I was with Jesus here on earth, and he kept on giving testimony to the written word of God as well as the testimony of what he had known about Jesus Christ. And that's why he suffered the persecution. But he continued. You will continue. I said you will continue. Uh, you don't count persecution as any strange thing. Uh, the Lord is very faithful. He has assured us that while we remain in this world, we're going to suffer persecution. In John chapter 16, John chapter 16, reading verse 33. John 16, 33. These things I, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, persecution, suffering, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. I'm reading verse 22. Acts 14. 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, not may, not that we may, we must, through much tribulation, persecution, enter into the kingdom of God. It's there, it's there, the persecution. And if you've not been persecuted, maybe it's because you are not light, you are not shining. Maybe it's because you don't have any salt to your testimony. Maybe it's because you are compromising. Maybe it's because you're using worldly wisdom in the practice of your faith. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Reading there in verse 12, it says, Yes, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Shall suffer persecution. Shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly. It is no strange thing, therefore, that a child of God suffers persecution. Actually, the people that know the Lord, the people that are children of God, the people that disregard the world, and then they have their allegiance, loyalty unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, unto Jesus Christ. The world will not understand them. Their unbelieving relatives will not understand them. Their unbelieving co-workers will not understand them. And the religious nominal Christians going to all the churches saying hallelujah, praise the Lord while they are smoking, while they are drinking, while they are committing immorality, they will not understand them. The people, the merry making so-called church goers, when you take your stand and you are living in righteousness, they will not understand. That's why it says yes. Surely, certainly, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I pray you will, you will live godly. You will live righteously. And when you live righteously, it has a consequence. And this is part of the consequence. 
or looking at. Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two, reading there in verse nine, it says, "Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the watch." Of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful saying. For if we, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him. Because of persecution. Because of trouble. Because of trial. Because of suffering. Because the husband will not give you an easy time at home. When you keep to the word of God. Because your wife will not give you an easy time at home when you keep to the world. Because religious people, churchgoers, will not give you an easy time when you keep to the world. Because there's a little pain, there's a little inconvenience, there's a little suffering when you keep to the word of God. If because of that, you deny him. It says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. I pray you will not deny the Lord. I said you will not deny the Lord. Uh, let's come back to Revelation now. Revelation I'm reading from chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. After the Lord showed John all this, then he gave him the thing that he ought to do. Revelation 1, 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And even though he was going through everything he was going through, still did not allow the pain and the hardship to hinder the God ordained ministry however hard life may be no matter what a man may be passing through he can still be in the spirit he can still be faithful he can still declare the message of Christ and he can still reveal the glory of the Lord to the people around him. And I pray for you that God will reveal his glory through you in Jesus' name. Now, we come to the second part of the message. The portrait of Christ in the vision. The portrait of Christ in the vision. I want you to notice here from verse chapter one, Revelation chapter 1, from verse 12, see Christ in his glorified form. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps, the paps with a golden girdle. He said, And his ears were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto brass, fine brass. And as if they burnt in the furnace, 
and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance as the sun shineth in his strength. And that's the description of Christ that John saw. The portrait of Christ in the vision. In this portrait, there are nine elements. Look at them. Number one, the sun, S-O-N. The sun in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Number two, the sun, S-O-N. In priestly, princely, prophet's clothes. Number three, snowy head and air. Symbols of the supreme wisdom of Christ. Snowy head. Snow, snowy. Snowy head and hair. Symbols of the supreme wisdom of Christ. Number four, searching eyes. Piercing, penetrating, probing every conscience. Number five, smashing feet to judge the condemned. Smashing feet to judge the condemned. Number six, sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror. The sound of a voice, like a mighty thunder. Sound of a voice of the mighty conqueror. Number seven, seven stars in his sovereign control. The seven stars under his sovereign control. Number eight, sharp sword that cuts and condemns. Sharp sword that cuts and condemns. Number nine, shining sun, S-U-N. Shining sun of his convicting countenance. As you look at the portrait of Christ, you see these things one by one. It tells us in verse 12, and I turn to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Stop there. The Son in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And already it, it tells us what the candlesticks Ah, if you look at verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, uh, the seven stars are the angels, the leaders, the minister of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And so what verse 13 is telling us there is that the Son of God, the Son of Man, as he promised before he went away, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, the Son of God was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of the church. Remember now that seven means completeness. Seven symbolizes fullness and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, According to his promise, he was in the midst of those seven churches of the whole church. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He will never leave the church. He is in the midst of the church. The son in the midst of of the seven candlesticks. Number two, the sun in priestly, princely, prophet's clothes. 
It's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed, look at the clothing now, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and got about the palms, the waist, with a golden girdle. This is the Son of God in his priestly, princely, prophet's garment. His garment and girdle, they show him as the priest. They reveal him as the prophet. They reveal him as the king. Wearing the robe worn by the high priest in the Old Testament, that's what we see here, the glorified Lord in the midst of his church. What's he doing? Closed like that, interceding for the church, empowering the church, supernaturally strengthening the church, so that as the ministers are faithful to the Lord, he, our chief, our high priest, he, our great prophet, he, our Lord and King, he will be officiating so that the church those candlesticks will be faithfully bearing light, the light of Christ in a dark world. Number three, the snowy head and hair, symbols of the supreme wisdom of Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, and his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow white like wool as white as snow what does that mean in daniel chapter 7 daniel chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 9 daniel 7 9 i beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and, his, and the hair of his head like pure wool, and his throne was like fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's Christ. That's Christ. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom. All the treasures of knowledge. His snowy white head and hair symbolize the purity of his truth. And a perfection of his wisdom. And he is in the midst of the church, purging, purifying, so that we can, he can make us blameless and holy. And so that we'll be able to declare his pure, unadulterated truth white and making people whiter than snow. Now, another thing we read in that verse, uh, in that verse 14. The latter part of verse 14, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes as a flame of fire, searching eyes, piercing, penetrating, probing every conscience. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 13, talking about Christ, about his eyes piercing, penetrating, probing the conscience. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened 
unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's Christ. That's the Lord. It's knowledge. There's nothing to be compared with that. It's searching eyes. It's piercing eyes. It's penetrating eyes. They see the depths of the heart of everyone in his church. And he looks with holy intelligence. He sees everything in the heart of everyone in the church. He sees accurately. And there are no secrets. There is nothing that misses his piercing, penetrating eyes. That's our Lord. And that's the head of the church. Number five. Is smashing feet, smashing feet to judge the condemned. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace. Talking about his feet now, and the reason he's talking about this is because he is the final judge. Because the Father has committed all judgment into his hand. Coming to the Old Testament in Psalm 110. 110. Psalm 110. Reading in verses 1 and 2. The Lord said unto my Lord. The Lord, you see how it is written there, capital. That's the heavenly father. That's God almighty. Said unto my Lord. Can you see that Lord? Still a capital L. But you see how the rest is written. The father saying to the son. Almighty God saying to his only begotten son. The Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou at my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy food too. You will tread on them. You will march on them. You will smash them. Smashing feet to judge the condemned. The Lord shall send it the rod of thy strains out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That, that's what you'll do. He will judge. And this Christ we're talking about with the feet like white, hot, glowing brass. That's a symbol of judgment on sin and sinners. He cannot, he will not condone sin in his church. He will smash and crush the unrighteous who remain in sin until they die. And they remain sinners for all eternity. He'll smash and crush them. Number six is the sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror. Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace. And his voice, and his voice, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Back up to verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror. In Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 30 and 31 25 30 therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as 
they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. And that's talking about Jesus Christ when he comes. And then he sounds with his mighty voice in Ezekiel chapter 43. Ezekiel chapter 43. Reading there in verse 2. Ezekiel 43 verse 2. And behold... The glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Psalm 29. In Psalm 29, reading to you there from verse 4, Psalm 29 verse 4 the voice of the Lord is powerful the voice of the Lord is full of majesty the voice of the Lord mighty and powerful full of majesty his sounding voice shows his majesty shows his power and it shows its authority. It speaks authoritatively in his church. And it speaks authoritatively to the church. And it speaks to the world authoritatively through the church. When Christ speaks in his church, in his church, Christ, the Savior, the Lord, he speaks with authority. When he speaks in the church, when he speaks, to the church he speaks with authority when he uses the world the church to speak to the world christ speaks to the world with authority when he speaks through the church and then we come back to revelation revelation chapter one in revelation chapter one we're not looking at the seven stars under his sovereign control in chapter 1 of revelation verse 16 and he had in his right hand seven stars he had in his right hand seven stars stars what does that mean verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches they are the leaders of the pastors of the churches a, a pastor is supposed to be like a star a, a pastor is supposed to be shining shining with the light of the star a pastor is supposed to be high above in character in behavior in action in everything he does that the lord looks at him like a star and then he says all those stars are in his right hand they are under his control his sovereign control hey, look at daniel chapter 12 daniel chapter 12 talking about the stars the stars daniel chapter 12 reading from verse 3 daniel 12 verse 3 and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness who are those people that turn many to righteousness I know we quote this when we are, you know, doing soul winning and, you know, talking about soul winning. I know we do that. 
But how many people do those soul winners turn to the Lord? Don't you remember when the prophecy came on John the Baptist that the spirit and the power of Elijah shall be upon him and he shall turn many to the understanding of the Almighty. That turn many to righteousness. Those are leaders of churches. It says they will shine as stars forever and ever. And so these stars, the seven stars in his hand, they are the pastors, they are the leaders, Christian leaders, and they are under a sovereign control. Come back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. If you are a pastor, if you are a leader, understand, the Lord is holding the seven stars, the ministers of the churches in his right hand. And his servants are under his control. They are held in his right hand. The place of perfect rest and the place of perfect protection. Now, I read that verse 16 because we're looking at the sharp sword that cuts and condemns. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth went a two sharp two-edged sword you know what that sword is the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and in hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 for the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. That's the sword coming out of his mouth. In Revelation chapter 2. Verse 16, Revelation 2, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That is, the people that do not repent, that, word will, that sword will cut, and that sword will condemn the sharp sword that cuts and condemns now number nine the shining sun of his convicting countenance revelation chapter 1 verse 16 in the latter part of verse 16 and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength revelation chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 verse 16 I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches I am the root and the offspring of David the bright and the morning star that's the Lord Jesus Christ and it's Jesus the Lord he shines in his church and it shines through his church. He reflects his glory through the church. And we who love him must reflect and reveal his glory to the watching world. You see, this is what John saw when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. What was his reaction? What was his response to what he saw? We come to Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and of hell and death. Here Jesus Christ, he lifted him up. He said, when I saw him, 
I knew him before. In the days of his incarnation and humiliation, I saw him before gentle, meek, and lowly. I saw him before we walked together in the streets of Jerusalem and Judea. We went together and we, I, I was always very close to him and I leaned on him. When I saw him this time, it's different. It's different. The one, John, who leaned on Christ's bosom in the days of his humiliation when he saw him and he saw his glory, his majesty, his dominion, and he saw this Christ, the way he was after the suffering, now in the glorification and exaltation, he fell down with fear. If a loyal, faithful believer became so fearful when he saw the glorified Christ, tell me, how will the sinner be? How will the sinner react when he sees Christ on the judgment seat? Here, Christ was not coming to judge John. He wanted to reveal something to him. And he knew this is Christ. And he knew it's Christ because in verse 1 he said, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He knew it was Christ, but unbelievable, incredible. When he saw Jesus Christ, he just fell down. Sinners who reject the Savior now. When they see Christ on that final day, how they will tremble with fear and fright. When they stand before the judge of the whole earth and they look at Jesus in the fury of the final judgment. But John, don't be afraid, fear not. And the Lord brought assurance to John with a touch of love and comfort. He was not to be afraid. He was to receive a new commission from Christ. Christ, who is the first and the last. Christ, the one that liveth but was dead. Christ, the one who is alive forevermore. Christ, the one who has the keys of hell and of death. These titles of Christ, as Christ announced to John on the Isle of Patmos, it brought reassurance and comfort to fearful John. Not only that, it also brought reassurance that, aha, uh -huh, Nero is not the final judge. Yes, Domitian, our persecutors, they do not have the final say. Yes, the key of the universe is not in the hand of our persecutors. I see my Christ again. I saw him when he took him. I saw him when those people came and then Peter drew out the sword and he cut off the ear of one of their servants and Jesus said, let it be. How will the scriptures be fulfilled? This is the time of my humiliation. Put back your sword. And then John stood back. He watched his Lord. As they took him. And they crucified him. And he saw how they crucified him. Hanging on the tree. And Jesus. When he was there. And the form of his visage was changed. And it, it was like. Looking at him. The beauty had gone. The suffering was too much. And Jesus, when he suffered like that, John could not bear to even look at that. But eventually he rose again. And he went to heaven. This humiliated Christ, how we see now, we know he gave us the truth. We know he is the way. We know he saved us. How we see now, and then Christ appeared. And as John saw Christ, and he realized that history and the universe, that the key of everything that was, that is, that will ever be, the key is in the hand of this Christ 
what a new commitment it brought to him and a new reassurance it gave him and then Christ said John all that you've gone through in the pot of boiling oil and as old as you are now and you are thinking maybe I came to take you home I didn't come to take you home I came to give you a new commission at 80 at 90 John you cannot retire I have a message to all the churches pick up your pen begin to write he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches and at this age 80 or 90 john began a new phase of ministry you'll begin a new phase of ministry the more you see christ and the glory of christ and the glory of christ becomes revealed to you again the more it will commission you to a new thing that you ought to do everyone who sees the vision of christ also receives commission to reveal him to others a true god-given vision a true god-given revelation leads to duty leads to responsibility write it john the vision you see the revelation you see is not for nothing and thus it was with john and with every other person that saw the revelation receive the message be renewed by the message and then reveal the message to others i told you that everyone that has any revelation of the lord a clear revelation vision of the lord will also have will always have a new commission because in the year that king Uzziah died i saw also the lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his throne filled his train filled the temple above it stood the seraphims each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly and one cried one to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke then said i woe is me for i am undone because i am a man of unclean leaves and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts is so a new vision isaiah it says my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this has touched thy lips and thy iniquities is taken away and thy sin is purged after seeing that vision what follows after revelation responsibility when you see a new vision of the lord of the glory of the lord there'll be a new mission also i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then said i everybody here am i send me rise up and let us pray here am i here am i here am i here am i here am I, send me. Have you got a new revelation of Christ? Do you see now who Christ is in his glorified form? 